On Two Wheels this week, we've more chat from Carl Fogarty in Daytona. Wayne and I travel to a British superbike meeting to sample some corporate hospitality. Sarah D travels north to meet the bikers at Devil's Bridge. And Gary Thompson is out and about collecting parts for his damaged Honda Blackbird. Ask anyone who isn't into bikes to name you a motorcycle and I bet you they'd say Harley Davidson. Perhaps they're thinking of something like this. On the other hand, if you come to the average sport bike rider and ask them what they think of Harley Davidson, I reckon you're going to get a slightly different answer. But I tell you what, they must be doing something right because they introduced this, the fat boy, in 1990 and they just can't make enough of them. So Harley is certainly doing something right. Their sales are up 12% this year, while the market as a whole is only up 4%. They sold 204,000 bikes last year and even outsell Honda in the States. They also outsell Harley Cruiser lookalikes in Japan, which must tell you something. Now the Harley experience is certainly a different one. The Yanks always say there's no substitute for cubes and certainly big inch engines like this one have a certain appeal. It might only produce a humble 62 brake horsepower at 5,500 revs, but it kicks out its 78 foot-pounds of torque at a lowly 3,000 revs, and that's the real trick. No doubt about it, this is the rumble in the jungle stuff legends are made of. You can putter along on a whiff of throttle at 50, wind it open, and the good old fat boy just gathers up his long johns and goes. Roll it off, and you're back to cruising, and that's what it's best at. Take it easy, lay back and enjoy it. So what makes Harley so special? Well, they say God rides a motorbike. Perhaps the Statue of Liberty did, I don't know. But here we have it. This is the fat boy, as I said earlier. And just look at that engine. It dominates the whole bike. It shouts motorbike at you. And I think that's why a lot of people buy Harleys. They're big and they're bold and they're brash. Really in your face stuff. There's all this chrome, this great big 45 degree V-twin, 1490cc. And it looks pretty old technology. You've got all your fins up there, push rod overhead valve, just two valve heads, nothing spectacular. Pumps out 60 brake horsepower, nothing spectacular there, but absolutely loads of torque to go with it. But just look at the detail on it. You've got these pipes, which I think are double skin because they certainly don't blue. And they don't get, well, they do get hot, but they're not over hot. So you've got the big pipes there. You've got a separate oil tank, and of course it's all chromed. And as I say, it really hits you in the face topped off by this tank, very distinctive shaped Harley tank. And look at the chrome on the top here. Speedo just sitting there, nothing as worrisome as a rev counter. Who wants a rev counter on a Harley? Big Speedo. That's the ignition switch there, which is a bit odd. I'm not really into Harleys, but what you have to do to switch it on, you have to flick that back, put this little round key in the old slot, switch the ignition on. Then you can turn it round like that. That switches it on. Then you take the key out again and put it in your pocket because if you don't it can fall out then you put that on there turn the ignition on and off but what you've got to remember to do is lock it off at the end of the day as someone can pinch your pride and joy but it's perfectly safe there if you actually sit on the machine if i can cross in front of the camera just cock a leg over you get a fantastic view up the front here i can see myself which isn't part of the fantastic part i must say but here you can see this big chromed headlamp and as you're going along, especially under trees, see the trees whizzing by and the, and the sun and the sky. It's a nice open air feeling. You can actually see the curved bars there as well. And you can really get into this sunny California culture, especially it's such a blisteringly hot day today. So you lay back and cruising, big wide bars. Controls are big and hefty. Look at the size of these levers. You won't see these on any Jap bike or any European bike, big and meaty things. And something else, these actual clusters for the different thumb switches, they're different as well. We all thought BMW were a bit odd. Well, on this one, if I put the ignition on, click right, turn the right hand one on, push it again, goes off, click left, left hand one goes off, push that again, it goes off. That is more logical than BMWs. You do get in, used to it. And also they do self cancel after a while, which is pretty useful stuff. All this goes together pretty well. It's designed to cruise, not to bruise, and it handles fine for such a fat boy, like 320 kilos fat. Sure, on twisty stuff, you can touch the footboards down, but at least it keeps you on your toes, and that's not a pun. Still, its gearbox is a great improvement on Harleys of old too. You can find neutral, which is one of the most important things, and the other gears go in, okay, might clunk a bit, but it works. 
The brakes works too, they're not the best in the world, the back one feels a little bit wooden, but it stops. So it goes, it stops, and you feel in control. That's as long as you can resist looking at your reflection in a shop window. So is it for me, you're wondering? Well, if you're a regular watcher, you probably know that I'm not really into custom cruisers. I still like my sports bikes. But I tell you what, in this sort of climate, beautifully warm, there's something about cruising along which seems to make a hell of a lot of sense. Why should you have to race everywhere? Something like this, laid back, ticking over, it's got its certain attractions. So perhaps if I had a garage full of bike, this might just make it. But perhaps at the moment, this reasonably slim person isn't for a fat boy yet. One thing I don't have any doubts about is that this is the ultimate pose machine. Love it or loathe it, you certainly can't ignore it. Having said that, if you're tempted, you better have a word with your bank manager because this one's not cheap at an on-the-road price of £13,295. Still, what price style? As they say, anything else is less. Hi and welcome to another Bikers Meet. Today we're up north and not only that, we're surrounded in history. Devil's Bridge is a 13th century stone-built bridge that spans the River Loon and it's just outside Kirby Longsdale. Now the bikers that come here must have some taste because the art critic John Ruskin said of this place, I have never known a place more naturally divine. So what sort of bikers come here off the M6? Well, I think we better go and uh, meet those divine little devils and find out. Are you mates with this lot round here? No, I'm actually, I've come up on my own today. Have so, you? Oh yeah, Billy no mates. So uh, who are you That's taking me. home then? <laughs> <laughs> you can come home with me. My wife's nice as well. Oh, well, you she? might like her. Oh, there we go then. Have you got, have you got a sidecar? <laughs> I don't need a sidecar. I've got a big bed. Oh, that's all right. We've got shovel mate do. <laughs> Who's this then? Excuse me. Can I have a chat? Is this your son? This is my son, yeah. I thought I, thought I could see the similarity in the yeah. faces. You know you look a bit like your dad, don't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, do you come here often? Yeah. Do you come with your dad every time? Yeah. Yeah? a few times on the bike haven't we? He's had to fetch the, the youngest with us. He yeah. enjoys it as well. He's only three, so... Really? Yeah, so he, he likes it, yeah. So how do you get them all down here? In the car. In the car? Yeah. So you've been on the bike today? Yeah. Yeah, you're going to be driving that bike one day? Yeah. Yeah? And we do bike and meeting places all over the country. Excellent stuff. So we might bump into you again, you never know. You never know, you never know. Might have spent a lot of time at sea, so it's probably not very unlikely. At sea? What do you do? I, uh, I lay fibre up to cables. Really? Yeah, I just got from Africa, actually. So, um, in fact, I should be in San Diego now, but I said to him, no, sod off, I'm not going. I want to go out in the sun and drive a bike. Yeah. So, obviously, you can't enjoy a bike unless you get on dry land, can you? Well, it's a little bit difficult, really. <laughs> we got, we got uh, exercise bikes, but it's not really this kind of the same ballpark, is it, really? No, no. no. How do you know I'm not a transvestite? I don't know. Oh, well, see you then. We're getting onto this funny tack again. I'm getting worried. <laughs> oh, you want to be? <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking about over there? Well, we've been on the bikes 37 years and then when my children grew up, we had about 20 year gap and then once the children grew up, we're back on the bikes. It's brilliant. Yeah? It really is, yeah. So you're Definitely. a born again biker? Definitely. No, no, well, not no, really. We've been, on a, we've been on about, what, 16 years now, you know, we had that break. Yeah. yeah. It's brilliant, yeah. Do you go to any other biker meets? Yeah, we're, 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 from, we're from Selby and mm -hmm. uh, there's a place called Sherman. There's uh, thousands of bikes to get there on a Wednesday night. Right. And there's no trouble. A lot of people think that bike is a tool, but they're not. And there'll be more from Sarah and the bikers at Devil's Bridge later in the show. Hello, I'm Jeff Thompson from the Rosper Advanced Motorcycling Group in Manchester. And today's advanced tip is to help you avoid hearing those words, I'm sorry mate, I didn't see you. As bikers, we've all heard that uh, this is a, a common excuse for people jumping out of junctions in front of our bikes and causing us to crash. How can we avoid it? Well, in a country like this and on a junction like this, it's, it's very difficult for somebody to see you unless you take defensive action. And what do I mean by that is as you approach a junction like this, you need to give yourself as wide a view as you possibly can into it. And that gives uh, a, a driver who's trying to emerge from the junction the earliest possible chance of seeing you. I approach this junction on my left, uh, I can see it's there, but I can't see very much about it really. Um, there's uh, about three or four feet of road clear, and that's it. I come past, and 
don't really know anything about that junction until I look into it on my way past it. Now I've spotted a junction on my left hand side, seeing that the road's clear I move out to a wide position which enables me to see really well into the junction, keeping a good view as I go past and I can see that it's clear and accelerate away. You know, if you open a motorcycle magazine, <coughs> go and buy any motorcycle mag, and have a look down the bike listings, the names of the bikes, the makers and the models, in particular, the models. Every month, we seem to be getting new models, new names, and you think, oh, how on earth am I gonna remember all this lot? They're coming out all the time. But also, if you look closely, you'll see names that seem to have been there for years, for donkey's years. This is one such name, this name here, Honda Transalp, yeah been around for ages, actually been around since 1987, can you believe, all that time. So they must have been doing something right, but it's grown up a little bit since then. Back in 87, the Transalp was a 600cc V-twin motor. Well, it's still a V-twin, but it's grown up now to a 650cc, well, actually 649cc, I think it is. But there it is, still a V-twin, and it's the same engine as Honda used in the Deauville. And that's got a good reputation. That's become a bit of a favorite with motorcycle couriers and they like machines or they like engines that are good for many tens of thousands of miles up and down the country all day long, seven days a week, some of them. So there won't be very much wrong with the motor. But it's not just grown up engine wise, it's grown up, I think, in its looks because it's still essentially an off-road looking machine, off-road style of bike. But I think it's becoming a little bit more road bike in its looks, in its bodywork. It's a bit more sort of streamlined now, shall we say, the way these indicators are all flushed into the fern. Oh, very, very smart. Perhaps lost that little bit of a rugged look that it had in its early days. And one other thing that you need to be careful of, I'll just show you this, watch this. People with short legs should beware because this is a very, very tall machine. But that can be a good thing because sitting this high gives you a great view of the road ahead. The Transalp isn't fast. It's not meant to be. It's got a nice, friendly sort of power delivery just about right for this style of bike. It really is an easy bike to ride, there's no nasty twitches, everything's just very predictable and very sure-footed. This is a race meeting in case you haven't noticed, in fact it's one of the rounds of this year's British Superbike Championship. And for lots of people that attend a race meeting, the script is you turn up on your bike, you pick your gear up on your helmet and you toddle off and pick your spot on the track to catch the action. Maybe you'd come for the weekend, lots of people camp here, they stay here all weekend and they enjoy the atmosphere. But if you're one of the privileged few, shall we say, you may get invited to sample some corporate hospitality. You need to be a VIP. Well, that's where we're going to take you today, behind the scenes, to see what goes on on the corporate side of things at a race meeting. And Wayne is in one of the suites with one of the team owners, Paul Bird. Now, why is he in a suite and I'm stood in the middle of a field? That can't be right. But the reason he's out there is because this is for the privileged few. And I'm actually privileged to meet Paul Bird here, the man behind this team. Paul, there's it's a lot of pressure involved in this and there's a lot of people coming to see you. How many guests are you going to uh, entertain? Well, we've had 150 tickets today and they've all gone out. Uh, and our title sponsor, Monster Mom, I think they've bought about around about 50, 60 tickets themselves. So. They actually buy them even though they're a, a team sponsor That's as well. That's right, yeah. We've had so many permanent passes that they have and then the rest of uh, that to buy with and bring in so many guests so around about 150 to 200 people that's today. a lot of bacon butties and, and and spare ribs on the barbie and things like that a lot of chicken as well yeah. is that right yeah plenty so, of chicken yeah so is that what we're doing chicken but yeah, this is what you do is you feed people you entertain them in what way do you entertain them like um Really, we're quite a, a relaxed team. We tend to have the fun emphasis around around the weekends racing. You know, we with a bit of a barbecue and a bit of a feed and a bit of a chat, and we show them around the garage, a quick tour, and a little bit of an interview with the two riders, Steve and Stuart. And and then we we like to emphasise to the people that treat it as if it's their own, and you know. Which is nice. Yeah, we're not very regimental yeah. about our race in our but, weekend. It's but very relaxed. Sponsorship is very, very important. And some people must be. What, what I've noticed is at the bike meetings, you get more people in casual attire. Mm. At the race car meetings, you get people in the whistle and flutes. But there's still big money involved in setting up a team like this. So you still get very wealthy or important people. You still touch mm. them in the same manner. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, 
with the sponsors, we, we had a three-year association with Vimto, which obviously went down well. You know, we obviously did the job right for them. Monster Orbit's our first year with them. Uh, I'm sure they're very happy, and we've looked to extend it to three years already. So. But depending if, you know, we, we like to, the team's progressed since 96 every year, you know, we start in a very small way and it's gradually got bigger and bigger and we, we obviously want to win the British Championship and progress and go on to something else, really. Well, I'm not still stood in the middle of a field, no. I've managed to blag my way into one of the suites. This is the V&M suite and this is Paul Nagel. Have I said that right, Paul? You have indeed. Right. Now, you're one of the team sponsors yeah. who put money into the team. So why does a company like yours do it? Why do you do it? Well, we got involved about 18 months ago for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One is to get some exposure for the brand. Uh, across the world we're the number one manufacturer of white goods uh, and we obviously want to tie up with a successful team, V&M are the perfect partners. So we get a lot of branding on the bike, on all the vehicles, on the leathers of the riders and Whirlpool will come across to people who maybe wouldn't see it in other mediums. And the second area is that we can invite customers along to the races, many of whom have never been to a bike race before. That's interesting you say that because talking to some of the guys in here and in the other suites, I've met a lot of people who, to be fair, don't know one end of a bike from the other. They're not bike people. It's very but true. They still come. Yeah. yeah. I think. Uh, is it because you want the money? Uh, that, it's a business, th isn't it? It is, yeah. I think what really, what, how we sell the day to them right. is that it's very informal. So a lot of them will go to a Grand Prix and they sit like two miles away from the track and they never see anybody. Here you can get involved, you can go in the pit garage, you meet the riders, you meet the mechanics yeah. Yeah. and it's a really, really excellent day. V&M treat you like royalty really. Yeah. Now when we say hospitality suites, we mean proper suites, we mean big massive things. Just look at this one behind me, this is Revy Red Bull, Ben Atkins mob this is. That's a coach, a huge coach with a massive big catering unit built into the side of it. These cookers, these hobs, these ovens, these everything that we'll ever need to make all sorts of fancy meals. Then they put the awning on the side of it. It's not just any old awning, not like you stick on a caravan. It's a proper big job, look at that. Big canopy, all beautiful with windows and everything. It's even got a floor in it. They're all the same, they've all got this. A nice plastic floor, all cushioned a little bit, so you're not even walking on the tarmac. And then to top it all off, they bring some pretty little plants in pots to make it look all really nice, really swish. Quite amazing, really, isn't it? But there'll be more from behind the scenes on the corporate hospitality world when you join us in a little while. I'm off for a burger. Excuse me, I, I almost... Sorry. <laughs> I almost fell over you. Right. You didn't notice, did you? Pardon? You didn't notice me no, falling no, no, over. No, no, no. no. It's the leathers, isn't it? Is it? Looking after you. Right. <laughs> You don't know who I am or what's going no, on no, now. Not a clue, no. No. Yeah. Oh, two wheels? Yeah, Men and wheels. motors? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 we oh. know it. Yeah. So you know your new model? <laughs> <laughs> You're the new model, are you? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I'm just Pol getting over it. Pulling two <laughs> You're sorry, what? I'll take leathers off and pause in my undies if you want. That's what they do That's on that men and motors. Oh, of the the oh bloody hell. I thought we were on that. <laughs> <laughs> Why is, is it? Don't tell me it's the top. Well, I've got to. If you need Anne to pull it down, there's a free and. <laughs> I've been told to make it um, shorter and I've been told to make it longer depending on how I wash it. I, I just, cool I just shrink, little, shrink it. Shrink it. Yeah. Even more. Oh, yeah. definitely. Well, there you That's go. a fine figure of a lass. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I might end up on the other side of the channel now. <laughs> I'll give you a shout and I'll come and watch. <laughs> You know, so he goes out and he doesn't get stopped because they look at him and think, he's a vicar. He said, seriously. And he had a bike, and the only time he used it was to go to the crematorium. <laughs> right. Seriously, because he said to me one day, I borrowed it off him, and he said to me, uh, where's your bike, Tony? He said, oh, it's, it's off the road. Oh, I'll lend you mine. And I thought, oh, he'll have a fire blade. And it was a old Honda, XBR 500. He says to me, I... Uh, I can't take the top box off, he said, because I use it for work. Right. So, well, what do you do? He said, well, I've got a crematorium with it. He said, uh, there's nobody in at the moment, but sometimes there's somebody in there. What do you do usually as a living, then? Uh, this is I'm a, a solicitor. Hobby. You're a solicitor? Yes. Uh, I divorce people. Do you? Mm. So you're, you're you'll handy be... to know, then, aren't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, what's more, yeah. I know all about the bikers who get divorced, because they say, yeah. oh, no, it only costs me £40 a month to run my bike, and I think, uh-huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I said, What sort of bike you got? And he said, Last one, I said, Oh, I've got a fire blade. I said, Really? And £40 a month, what it costs you on? Yes, including insurance. Oh, yes. And petrol. Oh, yes. And servicing. Oh, yes. I said, Hmm, good thing I'm not acting for your wife, isn't it? 
Ah. <laughs> so, uh, any bikers out there looking for a divorce? This is let the me one. know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. Too. And I'll let you get on before it, it melts. Public? Well, can I just take the, the bit that's Course melting? Out? Well, that's better. Okay. Well, it's lovely. Have a great day. So, tell me about these T-shirts. Do you make them for uh, every meet you go to? Yeah, we do Devil's Bridge. We do Matlock Baths. Um, they're the two we've got in production at the moment, and then we're just going to see how they take off and move around all the different meetings. So have each of the t-shirts got different bit bikes on? These are all our ones at the moment and it's fire blades for the Matlock Baths ones and then we're umming and ahhing about the ninjas but <laughs> <laughs> we will see. And who designs them? My partner Joff, he, um, he draws them all from start to finish. Uh -huh takes a long time because he's a bit of a perfectionist so well, <laughs> and then we're just artists anyway absolutely <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be right if he sees the mistakes then it yeah. goes back into production and get back into drawing again so. all right and then we just send them off for production oh my goodness so um you've got one for me then i think we can manage i can uh, only ask yeah a nice one for you oh excellent oh i love the color <laughs> oh excellent looks like my size brilliant right pocket that Got a t-shirt. <laughs> well, there was a very strong police presence at Devil's Bridge on this occasion, and Sarah will be back later to get the views of the bikers and also that of the police sergeant. Front forks. What's the difference? Conventional, like this Kawasaki here, or upside down, like this monster here? Well, if you come with me, I'll show you. OK, well, to make it easy, got a couple of forks taken apart here. Here is what we call a conventional fork. You've got a big chrome stanchion there, and there you've got the slider. Here's a bump, that slides up this one. What do we do with upside downers? Well, would you believe we turn them the other way up, and that's what's happened with this one. See, here you've got your slider sliding up there inside this massive tube. So, in effect, this one actually becomes the stanchion, and you're sliding up inside it. Now, why do we do that? It's all about rigidity. If I take this over to this stripped-down VFR here, see, this has got its conventional forks on there. So just as I said, it's got the chrome tube up there, just like that, clamped into these yokes, one there, one at the top. What happens when you put the front brake on? The forks tend to flex, and in fact, they really do flex. And you can actually get this tube bending slightly. Now, you don't want that, especially on a race bike. So if you turn it round and clamp in effect this bit, which is here, in these yokes, dead rigid, you're going to get very little flexing. And that's why we've got upside down forks. Now, if you're looking for a value for money second hand bike, you won't go far wrong with a Suzuki Bandit. Fantastic value for money, especially the 600 Bandit. In fact, brand new now, a 600 Bandit is only going to cost you somewhere around about 4,000 quid. So they're not that dear anyway, if you go out and buy a brand new one. But it is a cracking bike. Very sort of retro style in bike, sort of naked street bike, quite aggressive looking. Came out in 1995, the Bandit, and got a bit of a slagging off from some of the press because they said it's a parts bin special. It's been made up out of all the bits left over in the Suzuki factory, which is very, very unfair. Uh, I do think it's a nice looking bike. In 1996, they gave you an alternative version. They gave you the GSF 600S. They put the S on the end because it had a little half fairing on the front. In fact, there's one over there with a little half fairing. I don't think it looks as nice. I think if it's a bandit, the name bandit, it says this sort of aggressive thing, doesn't it? And I think it looks better as a naked street bike. A couple of examples here of the 600, as I say, came out in 1995. There's a pre-registered one here, so this is an early one, sort of 96. £2,799 it's priced up at here, and it's done 28,000 kilometres, so what's that? Oh, 15, 16,000 miles, somewhere there about. Much newer one here. That's obviously an import with it's having a kilometres clock. This is miles an hour, so this is a, a UK bike. And this one is a T-registered example here. This will cost you £3,499. It's got a full service history, it's data tagged, and it's had two very careful owners. Three right gits, but two very careful ones. Oh, I'm only joking. A nice looking bike, and whatever you say, you can't knock them really. There are loads and loads of people riding round on bandits. OK, Bandit 600S, yeah. Uh, great bike, I've quite enjoyed it. Uh, I've had it for 12 months. It's the bike that I, I sat my lessons on, passed my test on. I uh, got a love for the bike and decided that's what I wanted to buy. Uh, it's been a great bike for me, uh, comfortable to sort of use, uh, easy to handle. Uh, just the, the, the lightness, I mean, the reason for buying it initially was fitting in with, with the cost. Being a first bike, I didn't want to spend a lot of money and this was within my budget. Uh, Insurance-wise, it was very friendly. Uh, 
part of it and it's great for running with. I uh, enjoy the whole, the whole aspect of it. I bought a 1200 Bandit about 12 months ago now, uh, more than happy with it. Previously I had a 600 Bandit, that's what made me move on to the 1200. I just thought I needed that little bit more power, and which it's got a lot of. Um, brilliant, quite a good gearbox on it, possibly could do with a six gear on it, but um, there's, there's loads of modifications, changes you can make, there are loads out there, but it, it's, it needs a suspension a little bit tweaking but it's, it's brilliant otherwise loads of power loads of load and grunt get you out at bends otherwise it's, it's brilliant well, i've had the bandit since 99 about not quite two years and i just love it a bit i love the acceleration it could handle better liable the price for the price i mean if i've paid seven eight thousand pound then you'd expect it back to handle the spot on but it's an all-rounder it's a tourer do a bit of scratching with it. I've got a 1200 Bandit Suzuki. What I dislike, don't, don't dislike, note about it, not to dislike about it. What I like about it, grin factor. High 10 on the scale. I mean, what can you, how can you fault one really? The good fun, they go well. Uh, I think everybody that's got one retro, people on super bikes think it's just a Bandit, not going to do no, but they get a shock of the life when a Bandit passes them and they can't understand it. You put think you put right tackle on it. Shockers, forks, springs, tyres. Somebody in control and knows what he's doing. Bandit's good fun. Not only that, but the wheelie forever. It could be a bit comfier on seat. The backside gets a bit numb after a couple of hundred mile, but they all do. So he gets a numb bum, does he? That chap. Well, it just goes to show, doesn't it, that not every bike fits every person. What's comfy for one person? might not fit you and that shows you the value of getting in the showrooms and getting on them sitting on them having a feel of them but better than that getting out on them having a test ride insist on the test ride go out for half an hour an hour put plenty of miles on it because you never know after half an hour in the saddle it'll feel completely different to the way it does when you sat in the showrooms well this is a 1200 bandit looks exactly the same as a 600 but dead easy to spot obviously it's bigger but uh, easy to spot as one's going down the road the 600 it's got a silver engine the 1200's got a black engine, so that's how you tell the difference. Both the 600 and the 1200 Bandits are very, very popular. And, as you see, not that expensive second-hand. This week on Wayne's Warehouse, I'm going to tell you a little bit about jackets. I can't give you a lot of details, simply because we've not got much time to do it in. But I can go through the different types that are available to you. Basic retro jacket in textile with a little bit of leather. Leather look, maybe, I'm not so sure. Then we've got a good old textile jacket with lots of features, reflective, removable ar armour and removable liner. Loads of features in a jacket like that. That's the higher price category. Lower price category, because jackets will cost you anything from 50, 60 quid, right the way up to several hundred pounds. A nice lighter one, shorter version, for the summer. And then good old traditional leather jackets, plain black ones, for right, 80, 90 quid, going up to fancy three or 400 pound versions, loads of colours. The only thing is you want to see them on me, don't you? Because I look like a male model. You may. <laughs> Keep your comments to yourself if you don't mind. First of all, we'll just see if my budget was stretched to cost of them all, and I'll go and try a few on. Ta-da! Do I look like a male mogul? Eh? Should have got changed these legs in the changing room for some longer ones, shouldn't I? Right, in brief, very simple. When you're looking for a jacket, check the labels or ask the sales assistant. Because on the labels, it will indicate whether it's waterproof or not, whether it's got body armour or not, and whether it's the approval body armour or not. You obviously get what you pay for. The more you pay, the better the product goes without saying. Do you think this looks smart? Well, this will cost you 100 No, £1,099. Are you joking? Yes, I'm joking, because that's French francs, because this is a French product. It's actually around 120 quid. Does my bum look big in there? Thank you, madam. Very kind of you. Do you like this? This is a nice bit of kit, isn't it? Clover. Italian product. Lots of nice little features to adjust you, make you nice and tight and taut when you're going super fast on your super bike and relax them when you're actually just walking the streets. Fancy products that are made, used to make this. That is high-tech materials. We've got products that are indicated on the label, Cordura. We've got this one, Valtherm. These are obviously costly items. Therefore, the overall price of this jacket Bumps it up to 220 quid, but I think you'll agree, looks rather nice. If I could fasten it, that is. <laughs> there we are, nice and subtle 
black and grey will go with anything, won't it? So obviously bear that in mind. If you have got a red bike at the moment and you want to buy a red jacket, fair dinkum, but what happens when you swap your bike? Your jacket becomes redundant because you want to look the part, you want to match. Well, obviously consider a neutral colour, black and silver. It'll go with anything, won't it? This is 120 quid. That's half the price of that other baby that I wore before and sort of feels it, to be honest. Do you like that? Shorter version, a bomber jacket style. Fits very similar to a leather, nice and tight. Adjustable straps to make it nice and tight so it doesn't flop around in the wind. It's also got a removable liner and then up here, some air vents to let the air go through it. Eh? Some good ideas that are available on a lot of products nowadays. Have a good look, weigh the job up, ask the sales assistant because there might be features that you don't know about hidden in the product. Blue, does it suit me? Look at me grey streaks. Da -da. Eh? All those other bits were all textile. Good old leather. Loads of people like leather. Think about the colours when you're buying them because obviously this yellow doesn't go with this particular shirt. Small details. Fact is, you pay about 80 to 100 pounds for a leather jacket. It isn't going to be a protective version. No way for that amount of money. You only get what you pay for. You need to spend a couple of hundred quid, get one with full body armour in it, see approved, with bits of features on it, possibly a removable liner, or in the case of this one, when you remove the liner, it's air text, and they've even got a zip holder here for you to zip them into your pants. Think of everything, don't they? Eh? A couple of hundred quid. I'll just see if my credit card can stretch to that. Could be spoilt for choice, eh? and you might not have anywhere to put them all. The fact is, ask the sales assistant, read the labels, check out what you get for your money. It is worth spending as much money as you can afford, as I always say anyway. But when you do choose one, consider the colour. Because if you choose a red one and you've got a red bike, oh, it will look pretty. What if you swap your bike for a green one? You look a twit. Buy one with neutral colours, because there's loads of silvers and gold and all sorts out there. Then, of course, it'll last for several bikes away. Now, what do we do with these? Just stick them on the shelf for us, will you, Dave? <sighs> David Jeffries here, star on big bikes, because you're a big bloke, aren't you, David? Really? That's why we've asked you to sit down when you're interviewing, when I'm interviewing <laughs> you. <laughs> but yeah, we need to know, for our viewers out there, that your job now we know you're a racer but your job with this hospitality like it's i mean that's the thing nowadays i mean it's more than just turning up and riding the bike there's the whole hospitality package there's a the pr side of it as well i mean you know we've got the sponsors now as you can see by the uh, the sort of trucks and the the presence that they've got in the paddock now it's not you know it's not a little a little issue anymore it's big uh, there's big money involved there in the racing it? so the, the sponsors want to see you you know they want you there for signing autographs and it's nice i mean i, I like meeting the public it's good you know i, I mean it sort of makes you feel good when people come up to you and they oh, want to talk to you. Yeah, and yeah. it's nice, you know, and that's what the people are here for. And at the end of the day, we've got to remember that if the people didn't turn up, we wouldn't be here. They're the customer, aren't They're they? the customer yeah, in a exactly. way, yeah. yeah so, you yeah. know, we've got to be, yeah. you know, we've got to be there for the customers so they can come and do it. They come and, you know, then they buy our replica helmets, they buy our replica boots or whatever, <laughs> and they also come and watch us race. Well, they are very busy places, this, and I've managed to track down my top man here now, Jack Valentine. Jack, just tell me what the format of the day is for the, the VIP who comes see you well it, it all starts the week before when um, when we issue the tickets we do a, a nice uh, itinerary for them map of the circuit how to get there and then uh, the guests start arriving usually around about 10 half 10 uh, there's some breakfast on for them obviously coffee etc and then um, we they usually have a, a mill around then look in the garage uh, watch a bit of racing and then come back for, for lunch around about two o'clock. It's all proper stuff, isn't it? You've got chefs in and, and everything, and it's all... There's none of your burgers on... No, no, it's no, no burgers and uh, chip butties and that it's sort of stuff. It's uh, service stuff, some of this, isn't it? You know? Yeah, I mean, they're important people. I mean, uh, without, you know, the sponsors and, um, and, and our other partners, you know, we wouldn't be able to compete. Right. And, I mean, uh, we're doing, hopefully, a good job for them. They're using us as a marketing tool to... Um, hopefully sell more uh, home appliances and stuff and uh, you know you've got to give them a good day out well wayne and i had a great day out and you can see the conclusion of it including a chat with steve heslop on two wheels next week my goodness there's a 
Big knot of people. What, what's going on? What's going on? What's happening? All the police are yes. stopping all the bikes for what they call safety checks. Right. And they're not picking each one, they're just picking every bike out and sending it to a vehicle inspector at point up there. Right. All the cars are allowed to go past. Uh -huh. So it doesn't matter how unsafe all the cars are here, but every bike's being checked. Oh. I mean, they've been here, they've been here all day and everyone's fed up with it. I went up there to warn yeah. bikers coming in and yeah. they gave me a caution. So we've just asked Paul, me. just asked Paul Stop if you go and see what, see if they'll interview him. him. See oh. if he'll let them interview him. She's the worst one. But what? we had plain clothes oh, police officers in that van and they came out and put leathers on and came and mingled with the crowd down here. So really? they're obviously they're mingling in with the crowd as well and checking the bikes. They're walking around checking the bikes as they're parked. It's just crazy. We'll see what he says to Paul. And have you have you seen anybody actually coming round on a bike that you think shouldn't be here? No. No, no. not at all. No. We've been coming here 20 years and we've never seen anything like this. Stopping the stop. minority that spoil it for the majority is fair enough. But when people are parked up, just come in to relax, checking the bikes, it's like going into your garage at night mm. and doing it. It's an infringement on privacy. I'm sure it is. If they're inspecting they're vehicles, the inspect days. every vehicle. Don't just pick the motorcycles out. Well, I've just found Sergeant Malcolm Hodgson, and he's going to tell me what's actually happening here in the inspection part of this biker's meet. Now, it's a bit daunting finding a policeman coming up to you saying, can we have a look at your bike? What actually happens when you get here if you've been pulled in? Right, well, the idea is really to, to, to look at the bikes with a view to road safety and construction and use. By that, I mean, um, we've pulled about 80 bikes today. Mm. Of those, uh, approximately 25 have actually had illegal parts on and that. Now the problem with that is the race can exhaust and that that are fitted to some of the bikes are very noisy. Um, in this area we get a, a lot of complaints from the residents of the local villages and that on the popular biking runs of excessive noise, particularly on Sunday afternoons when there's as many bikers here as there is and it's a popular venue. We've got a gentleman from the vehicle inspectorate as well here and also from the driver, uh, driver vehicle licensing agency who are checking on taxed vehicles. Yeah. But the priority from the police point of view is road safety. We're looking at tyres, uh, whether they're, they're, they're suitable for road use and we're looking at the exhaust, brake, maintenance of the lights. Um, for instance, you can see over there some, one of the bikes has a blue headlamp. Well, that cl quite clearly is a, is a danger. Uh, to anybody else on the roads, another car driver might not see that bike coming or might not realise what it is. So we're in the business of reducing accidents. In the Kirby Lonsdale area and the routes radiating from Devil's Bridge over the last 12 months, I've had several uh, motorcycle fatalities and in several of those cases the bikes have proved to be uh, have basically faults, faults on them, uh, they've not been well maintained. Right. So that's really what the check to here to, is about. We're not out to persecute bikers, that has been said to me today. It, right. it, it, it is a check based on safety and based on reducing accidents in this area. The vast majority of the bikes have been pulled in here, uh, very few of them will appear at court. They're given a notice basically to remedy the defect on the bike, put a, a legal exhaust on it if that's the problem, or sort the headlight out if that's the problem. They then got 14 days to produce it at an MOT testing station. If the vehicle's all remedied to satisfaction, uh, the MOT tester stamps it and that's the end of the matter. Right, so therefore all we have to do is know that our bikes are legal, That's right. come to any meet yeah. and everybody's happy. That's come to Devil's it. Bridge and enjoy yourself. The vast majority of the people here today are law-abiding citizens, they keep their bikes in good condition and they've had absolutely nothing to fear from the convivial. Well it's been absolutely brilliant here at Devil's Bridge, in fact it's so gorgeous and I loved it so much that I bought the t-shirt. Now bikers have been here, the police have been here and no doubt that sort of dispute will go on for a little longer. So just be safe, just be legal and uh, watch out, I might be at your meet next. Take care. As you can probably gather, we're here outside Barry Jones's in Liverpool. I've rang him up a couple of times, spoke to him on the phone, and he assures us that he's got a couple of panels that were going to do us in the right colour. So what we need to do is get inside and have a look inside this Ladin's cave. Barry Jones? Yeah. Gary Thompson, we spoke on the phone. How are you doing? All right, they're on the back there panels, yeah. That's right, yeah, I see you've got them out for yeah. me. <clears throat> this is the right-hand side one that you asked for. Yeah, yeah. A little scuff there and a little mark, but... Other than that, a straight panel. Yeah, you did say they were slightly scuffed. Yeah. What I'm looking at really is that there's no actual breaks in the panel mm -hmm. that has to be welded, plastic welded or whatever. Yeah. Uh, the scuffs we can probably get away with, maybe that one will even buff out. Yeah, I have checked, it is all complete, no cracks and nothing in it. 
that's uh, that's a good sign. You don't see them at 100 mile an hour anyway. 100 mile an hour, as slow as that? Yeah. Okay, so that's that. Tank. Yeah. Tank, there's the other one. Uh, Black Bear tank, good condition. No dents in it, none of them uh, nasty dents what you get in them. Yeah, it's had a tank pad on it, but obviously with a bit of uh, elbow grease that'll come off. Yeah, it looks we sell tank pads as well. You sell tank pads as well, yeah, because I'll be looking for one of them. Good lad. What sort of, what sort of money are we looking for? Uh, the tank's going to cost you £100. Uh, the panel's going to cost you 80 quid. 180 Yeah. Are you open for a bit of bartering? Oh, love it. Love haggling. Let's go 130 for the pair. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Uh, I'll need a new set of incontinent pants, but... <laughs> uh, if you give me 150 quid, we'll have a deal. 150 quid for the two? Yeah. Okay. Cool. You've got a deal. Lovely. Thank you. Okay, so I don't think we've done too bad. We've got ourselves a reasonably decent right and lower fairing. A few scratches on it, but as Barry said, nobody's going to see that 150 mile an hour. We've got a nice fuel tank. I'd say it was mint. 150 quid the two. I think we've got a bargain. But we've still got lots and lots to do. So what we need to do is get off to the next breakers and see what else we can get for the damn blackbird. So here we are at the second port of call. This is Rivington Barn Motorcycles, not too far away from the famous Sunday meeting place, Rivington Barn. So here we are inside, as you can see, panels all over the, all over the walls again, lovely. Got quite a few nice bikes here. Most of these you could actually ride away yourself. FZR 1000X up, needs a little bit of work doing on that, bit of body filler on it, and needs rubbing down. FZR 600, nice bike again, you could virtually ride that away. NC 24, 1150 pounds, lovely. Going up into the space up here, we've got all these fairing panels, etc, etc. Coming round the room, more fairing panels, side panels, seat panels. We've got a fire blade there, if you need a complete fairing for a fire blade in that colour, well there it is. It's even got a front mod guard as well. Another CBR 600 this time, that's got indicators on it as well. Complete fairing, we've got a fuel tank, we've got the V piece that joins in the center. We've also got a seat panel. Moving on, more panels, seat panels for a CBR, Blackbird, etc. Okay, more bikes, nice 2500 ready to ride away. CBR 900 Fireblade, Suzuki Hayabusa. Nice bike for somebody, I wish it was me, but it's already sold. We've got a VFR 750 there, it says HBI clear, but it's supplied with panels. Now that looks like a category D to me. Let me explain these categories to you. Category A and B are brake only. They can't be put back on the road, they can only be used for spares. Category C, that is slight frame damage, maybe fork damage and plastics damage. Category D, that is basically cosmetic, that's all fairing side panels, whatever. Anyway, enough of that, we've got the list, let's go and see what he's got for us. And we'll rejoin Gary on Two Wheels next week on what proved to be a very fruitful trip to Rivington Barn Motorcycles. Also on next week's show, Jeff rides Honda's new Super Cruiser, the VTX 1800. Sarah D travels to another bike meet, and we chat with top superbike rider Steve Hislop to discover that there's more to his job than just riding the bike.